it's time to start anyway. Look what I found. <laughs> All right, that's excellent. <laughs> I, ha I didn't realize I had that. <laughs> that's fantastic. You can follow along, you know, and, and also, you know, I lent my, my uh, uh, teacher's manual to a friend and they have not returned it. And, and that friend right now is in Scandinavia on vacation. So, you know, there's no way I can get it back for these last few lessons. So um, you can be the one that tells us the reading for next time, because I don't have that. In, in the book that you have, it'll tell you what the reading is. Um, uh, this, by my, okay, this, the lesson we're doing today is the, the third installment on the messianic fulfillment. That's, that's my uh, recollection. Is that, is that what you guys, um, <clears throat> so in, in messianic age, part one, the messianic fulfillment, part one, we met, we met Mary, uh, you know, the, the, the new Eve, the new Ark of the, of the Covenant, and, and we heard the Nativity um, Chronicles, and, um, and then in, uh, and we, we heard the, the story about, uh, you know, that Jesus is uh, the flight into Egypt, the return from Egypt, uh, um, uh, Jesus' experience in the temple uh, when he was about 12. Um, and I hope you guys followed up and looked up that, uh, the, the YouTube that I recommended. I'm sure it was you guys I recommended it to. The one about uh, on my father's side that, did I, did I not recommend that to you? There's a, there's a, a it's a kid's, you know, it, I use it in vacation Bible school. I think I did mention it. If you have not looked it up, please do. It's, you know, it's, for kids, but but it they really did a good job in describing that that uh, event in Jesus's life. So I hope you look it up. Um, okay, so and then part two was uh, the, the third luminous mystery, you know, the proclamation of the kingdom, and and we heard the you know many parables and um, uh, uh, you know the Jesus gathers twelve apostles. And I, one thing I'm not sure that I have underscored enough, um, one of the predictions about the Messiah was that he would reconvene, you know, reassemble the 12 tribes, you know, recognizing that 10 of the 12 tribes were, were lost, were, were bred out of existence by the Assyrians. Uh, very, very cunningly, very cleverly. Um, so, but, but the, the prophecy was that the, the 12 tribes would be reassembled. Jesus picks 12 apostles, 12. That's not, that's not a coincidence. He is reassembling the 12, the 12 tribes of, of Israel. So, you know, there's, there's nothing accidental about what Jesus does. It, you know, it's all deliberate. It's, it's part of the plan, the, the whole plan of salvation. So we learned that in part two. Now in part three, this is going to be a tough lesson today because it's the passion and death um, and, and all that leads up to it. So um, uh, I think without further ado, we will, um, I'll start the, the video and then we can talk about it afterwards. You know, I, I really have to compliment Jeff Cavins. You know, this study is, is well done. I mean, it's it, brilliant. It, it, there are lots of other Bible studies, lots of other Bible studies, and you always have to pick and choose, you know, because he, this is an overview of, of salvation history. So you pick and choose those events that further the plot line. And, and so you know in reading the text that there are so many other stories that, that he just can't include. But the ones he did include are significant and, and certainly, certainly further the plot. I think this, the, 
the way he laid out this study was masterful. And also in reading the text that goes along with this study, you know, Jeff Cavins is awesome. Tim Gray is on a different plane. So you get the best of both with these guys. I, I just can't say enough good things, um, you know, about, about them. Um, okay, let me, oh, I just, one thing that I just wanted to mention, I, and this goes back to our previous conversation, I actually had the opportunity to meet Sister, Sister, uh, and, and to talk to her. So at, at one of the Los Angeles um, Religious Education Congresses, I, I got to spend quite a bit of time talking to her and told her my background, and we just, you know, it, she is an amazing person, very but anyway, back on back on subject, messianic fulfillment. Um, we are now, uh, geez, oh, um, I don't. I think we. I think we went over it. I just want to say it again. That when Jesus and um, and his apostles are up in um, Caesarea Philippi, and and Jesus says, you know, who do they say? Who do the people say I am? And and Peter answers, and he says. Um, you know, they say, some say you're Elijah, some say you're, you know, Jeremiah, some say, you know, but who do you say I am? Um, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There's a detail that's in the book that's not in the presentation, and I don't want you to miss it. And that's the, the use of the term living, okay? Um, that, that, uh, the son of God, you know, there were lots of people that claimed to be the son of God, all the Caesars, you know, all the Roman emperors claimed to be the sons of God, you know, uh, Pharaoh claimed that, you know, the Pharaoh was God and his son was the son of God, you know, lots of sons of God, whenever, and, and so son of God, you see that term a lot in, in scripture, whenever the term living is added as the qualifier to son of God. So now it's not son of God, it's son of the living God. That term is only used when you are drawing a distinction between the gods, you know, the pagan gods of other peoples and the God of Israel. Because remember, in, remember, uh, it's in Psalms and it's, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that, they are, they have eyes, but do not see, mouths, but do not speak, ears, you know, but do not hear. Uh, they're made of stone and wood, you know. That it, so in drawing a contrast between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the gods of the other peoples, they use the term living because our God has eyes and he see our God is a God who sees who's the first person that says that do you guys remember um God I'm, now I'm having a senior moment Abraham you know Sarah's um, Hagar who's the the first person that tells God you are a God who sees Hagar you know uh, an Egyptian I love it uh you know you are a God who sees you are a God you are an all-knowing God you are you know you're a living God and so that, that's a distinction. So Jesus says, you know, flesh and blood has not told you this. You know, the, the, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but, you know, the, the God, you know, God told you this. The Holy Spirit told you this. So, and, and, and that, I just didn't want that little detail to, you know, to pass us by. That um, they're making a distinction. Peter, the rock. And in that same conversation, Jesus says, you know, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. Peter, the rock is the one who answers. You are the son of the living God. Isn't that amazing? I, I just little tiny details that mean so much. Okay. Um, without any further ado, let me um, screen share and get this. Okay. 
Welcome back to our study. Today is the third part of the Messianic Fulfillment. And this is going to focus on the, uh, the last third, the Passion Hour that Jesus came to earth for, and that is to give himself up as an offering for all of our sins. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we thank you for your great love for us. We are that neighbor, the one that you loved. You gave your life for us. We pray, Lord, that we would not only receive that love, but respond in faith. To respond in faith and to love and to release others, even as you have loved and released us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're now going to take a look at that last third of the Messianic Fulfillment. In the first part, we looked at the infant narratives, the birth of Jesus, and the, the early ministry of Jesus. In the second lesson, we looked at the traveling from up north in, in Galilee, all the way down now to Jerusalem. And now we're going to look at Jerusalem and that final week, the Passover week, where Jesus is going to give his life as the Paschal Lamb. And it's a beautiful thing that he has done for us. And now he's going to ask us to go and release other people and to love other people as part of his mission, the mission of the Messiah. There's a couple of themes that we've been following throughout our entire study that I just want to quickly re review. And one of those is this idea of God as king. And very early on in the, in the early world, in the turquoise period, we saw that Adam and Eve basically ousted God from the throne of their life. They said, no, God, we're going we're gonna to do it our way. And right away, God instituted a plan in Genesis 3.15, where he said that the seed of the woman would crush or deeply bruise the head of the enemy. But in the process, the anointed one, the Messiah, would be, would be bruised. And so at the very, very early on, Adam and Eve kind of pushed God off the throne. And from that point on, with this proto-evangelium, this good news, God has a plan where he's going to, he's going to bring back his rule and his reign in our lives. And we see that uh, coming to some maturity in the purple period when Israel asks for a king. And God wants to be their king, but they're not ready for that. And God says to the prophet, give them what they want. And they end up with an earthly king. And God rules through that earthly reign of David, earthly kingship of David. So that, that issue of God ruling and reigning in our lives is something that we, we, we saw at the beginning. We want to continue to remember that all the way till this lesson when we see the king of kings coming into the holy city of Jerusalem. The other theme is the lamb. And you'll remember early on, not only did we, did we uh, have this idea of kingship introduced, clear back, remember in Genesis 15, that kings would come forth from Abram, uh, right here, uh, kings would come forth from uh, Abram. But we also have the idea of the lamb in this early patriarchal uh, period. Lambs are important. Of course, the lamb in the uh, Egypt and in, in Israel in Exodus chapter 12, where God says, take a lamb from your family, and that's going to become the, the Passover lamb. That is not the lamb that we're going to be looking for. That lamb that we're looking for started here in Genesis chapter 22, when Abram is going to sacrifice Isaac, but God stops him and says that he will provide the lamb. And then later on in the New Testament, John the Baptist meets Jesus at the Jordan and says, behold, the lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. So when we think of Jesus, the Messiah, where we have to remember this kingship and also that he is the Paschal Lamb. He is that suffering servant that Isaiah 53 uh, speaks about. Now, the people are looking for a triumphal king to deliver them from Roman domination, but that's not what they get. They get a suffering servant, the way of peace, not the way of of aggression and violence. And that's something that we want to take a look at in this lesson is we want to pay very close attention to this issue of violence versus peace. The way of Jesus is peaceful and the way of the world is violent. So we're going to take a look at that. So as we begin in, in uh, Luke chapter 19, we begin with the triumphal entry, Jesus' entry 
into Jerusalem. And it starts in verse 28 and goes all the way to verse 40. Now, this is also covered in Matthew's gospel in chapter 21. Luke says, and when he had said, when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and to Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village opposite where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, uh, those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their garments on the colt. They sat Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their garments on the road as he was now drawing near at the descent of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, the language that's used here is very consistent with the greeting of a king in the Old Testament. For example, in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, Solomon, and also in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9, this spreading of garments. It's also important to remember that it's the Passover when Jesus chooses to come into Jerusalem. And they start quoting a particular psalm, Psalm 118 which is called one of the Hallel Psalms. Psalm 118 would be one of the Psalms that you would quote on the Passover. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's what they are quoting as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And so they seem to have this uh, knowledge that it's Passover, obviously, but they are, are attributing Psalm 118 to Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we want to revisit that theme that we looked at last session, which was the king is coming. He's making his visitation. Are you going to catch it or are you going to miss it? These people caught it. They caught it and said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, also in chapter 19, starting in verse 41, Jesus is going to weep over Jerusalem. So let's take a look at why he is weeping over Jerusalem. It says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. You can imagine how sad that was for Jesus. When we take pilgrimages to the Holy Land, I try to go every year, take groups to the, to the Holy Land. Uh, we, we go down the Mount of Olives and we stop about uh, halfway down the Mount of Olives at a place called Dominus Flavit, where God wept. And we stand right there and share this message as Jesus is overlooking the ancient temple mount where Solomon's temple was built. He wept over Jerusalem, saying, would that even today you knew the things that make for peace. You knew the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So Jesus is looking at Jerusalem and he's He's wanting them to understand the way of peace, but it's hidden from their eyes. For the days shall come upon you. Now he's warning them that they're going to be hemmed, hemmed in. They're going to be attacked. Okay. And he says, for the days shall come upon you when your enemies will, ca will cast up a bank about you and surround you and hem you in on every side and dash you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So he weeps over Jerusalem and, and he says, would that you, you knew about the things of peace, but it's not going to be that way. You're going to be hemmed in. Not one stone will be left upon another. Now, what's interesting about this is that in Matthew's gospel and in, and in Luke's gospel, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, in chapter 19, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, but you also remember that earlier on in Luke's gospel, in chapter 13, he also lamented 
over Jerusalem. So there's two times here in Luke's gospel where he's weeping and lamenting over Jerusalem. In 19, he's talking about the peace that, they're, that they are missing. And in chapter 13, he laments over Jerusalem and says, your house is desolate and barren. And some people ask the question, what does he mean by your house is desolate and barren as he's looking at that temple? You see, clear back here, when Judah went into exile, into Babylonian exile, the Babylonians came down and took a lot of the furnishings out. But Jeremiah the prophet records that they took the Ark of the Covenant and they hid it in a cave and they sealed that cave. There's no evidence that that ark was brought back into the Holy of Holies 70 years later when they returned in the yellow period. And so there's a good chance here that what Jesus is referring to is your house, the temple, is empty. It is desolate. There is not that, that ark of the covenant where you have the mercy seat where God dwells. But here's what's really interesting is that Jesus says that you, he says this in Matthew 23, but he also says it here in Luke. He said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there is this uh, relationship between saying Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and seeing the presence of Jesus. Now we know that Jesus came 2,000 years ago. And we know that he's going to come again at the end of time. And he, we know that he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So how does the Lord continue to come to us? How does he make his appearance to us, his parousia, the unveiling of the Lamb? How does it happen and how is it related to Psalm 118? Well, if you're Catholic, you experience it every Mass. In every single mass, you experience the real presence of the Lord, and it's attached to Psalm 118. Now, I'm going to share that with you in here, here in just a moment, but also remember that after he comes in, and after he says this, he cleanses the temple. In Matthew's gospel, he, you know, he cleanses the temple in Matthew 21, and in 23, he says, you'll not see me again. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when do, when do we say this? Well, we repeat this in the Mass, in the preface and acclamation of the Eucharistic prayer. Listen to what the priest says. This is, this is beautiful. The priest says, and so, with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim, holy, holy. Holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then we go down to our knees. And then what happens? The words of institution. This is my body. This is my blood. And bread becomes the body of Christ. And wine becomes the blood, the precious blood of Christ. And we have the real presence of Christ. You will not see me again until you say the words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you're Catholic and you go to mass, that's what you experience. Just like Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and then cleansed the temple. So he makes his entry into our life in the mass in a wonderful way. And then we receive him in our mouth, into our stomach, the temple, and he cleanses us. And so we worship very much like this. He cleanses us, and the church teaches us that if we receive the Eucharist, we are forgiven of venial sin. Mortal sin, you have to go to confession. Now back to the text in Luke chapter 19. We haven't left chapter 19 here yet. I mentioned earlier this issue of peace. That Jesus wept over Jerusalem and he said, uh, you know, he wanted them to choose the way of peace. Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace. Af after they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They say, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, doesn't that sound a little bit odd? 
peace in heaven. You would expect to hear peace in heaven and on earth, but it's just peace in heaven. Jesus approaches Jerusalem and weeps. Would that even today, you knew the things that make for peace, but they're hidden from your eyes. And so this statement that they make is a reflection of their rejection of peace, rejection of peace. In fact, we're going to see this just a little bit later on uh, demonstrated that they reject the way of peace and they choose the way of violence. So in chapter 22 now, moving on in chapter 22 and looking at uh, verses 7 through 13, we have the Passover preparation. So he comes into Jerusalem and now he's making preparations for the Passover, the central redemptive event in the Old Testament where Israel was released from bondage, freed and uh, uh, made a, a new people with a covenant. This is what's going to happen in this wonderful, wonderful uh, Passover celebration. So as you look at this in verses 7 through 13, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house, which he enters, and tell the householder. So they make this preparation uh, for the Passover. And then, starting in verse 14, Jesus institutes the Eucharist. He institutes the Eucharist. Now, there's a, some really interesting parallels here when we talk about the preparation of the, uh, of the Passover and the institution of the, of, the new, of the Eucharist. When David came into Jerusalem, in the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Remember, he came in and he brought in the Ark of the Covenant. What did he do? He offered bread and wine. So David offered bread and wine in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The new, the new David, or the son of David, is also offering bread and wine. In 1 Chronicles, back in the Old Testament, we know that David offered, he offered bread and wine in first chronicles 16 what did david do he tells the levites to praise god and to give god thanks perpetually so praise and thanksgiving was so important in the kingdom of david that the levites were told to do this constantly constantly now here's what's really interesting is that in the, in the uh, time of, of Jesus in the first century, the rabbis taught that when the Messiah comes, all sacrifices will cease except for one sacrifice. Now, there's a lot of different sacrifices, you know, and offerings. You have guilt offerings and bread offerings, all types of different offerings in the Old Testament. All these sacrifices will cease but one. That is the thank offering, the toda offering. The thank offering is the only one that will continue. And how do we say thanks? Eucharist. Eucharist. And so at the heart of the Passover meal, in the heart of the Eucharistic celebration, is this idea of thanks to give. Thank Got it. And so that's what Jesus is, is doing here. And he says, do Thank this you. in remembrance of me. We have the actual, the last supper in Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. But, but notice this right in the middle of it. He says, one of you is going to betray me. In fact, let's just look at that. He says, um, look at verse uh, 14. And when the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a chalice. These words are so familiar to us, you know, as Catholics, because they've been repeated hundreds of times in our life. But does that mean that we have re-crucified Jesus hundreds of times? Has he been put to death hundreds of times? No. 
He was sacrificed once for all time. And we enter into that sacramentally. We repeatedly enter into the once and for all sacrifice sacramentally. There's a mystery. There's a mystery there. But it's not foreign to the, to the Jews. For them to remember something, the word is zakar, Z-A-C-H-A-R, zakar. To remember in the Jewish tradition isn't just to mentally, you know, go back and say, okay, I'm going to remember what that must have been like. That's not how you remember. But you remember by, how do you remember the Passover? Set the table. And enter into it as though we are there. That's how they would do it. Set a table setting for Elijah and the whole thing. We remember the Lord's, the Lord's Passover. We remember this love sacrifice sacramentally in the Mass. We relive it every time we go to Mass. It says, and he took a chalice and when he had given thanks, toda, the thank offering. When he gave thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. This is the bread and the, and the, and the wine. And when he had given thanks, Eucharist, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So once again, we do that in remembrance of him sacramentally. And likewise, the chalice after supper saying, this chalice which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so what's Jesus doing? Jesus is fulfilling the old covenant in every way. It's all been pointing to him. He's fulfilling the old covenant. And now he's establishing what Jeremiah called a new covenant. What happens to the old covenant? It's fulfilled. Does he just do away with it? No, he fulfills the old covenant and now is establishing a new covenant, not in the, the flesh and blood of animals, but in his own flesh and his own blood. And so do this in remembrance of me. And then in chapter 22, starting in verse uh, 39, Jesus goes to a place that he is very familiar with. In fact, he takes his disciples to this place often. It's called the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means the olive press. It's the place where the pressure is on. And this is where Jesus is taking his disciples to pray. And he went there, he went there often. This is what is really interesting. We started off our whole journey together in a garden the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, we had the first Adam and Eve in that garden. We also had them betrayed by an enemy who acted like he had their best interest in mind. And the first Adam failed. And God raised up a son, Israel, firstborn among all the nations, but they too fall short of the glory of God. And so we see here at the end, God sends his only begotten son and he will do what Israel failed to do. He will also pay the penalty for the broken covenant in Exodus 32, the golden calf. And he, along with his mother, the blessed Virgin Mary will make right what the first Adam and Eve got us into. The knot they tied us in will be untied in Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary working together. And so we see Jesus going to the garden, the oil press, and he prays and he says, the hour has come. He has taught for three years. He's established his kingdom. He has given us authority in Peter. He has given us an example he even said earlier on in John chapter two, when his mother said they have no wine, he said, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His hour has come now, and he's in the garden. In fact, it tells us that in this place of pressure, his sweat was like great drops of blood because of the pressure, knowing that the sins of the world were about to come on him. And this is very, very powerful. Uh, it's a story of, of, of two gardens. 
there he says something so important in verses 39 through 46. He said, not, and you can hear his humanity crying out. Remember what we, we talked about earlier, that Jesus is one person, two natures, human nature and a divine nature, two wills, a human will and a divine will. And here he is about to face the sins of the world to pay the ultimate price. And he says, Father, if there is another way, nevertheless, and this is the key. This is where what Paul calls the last Adam, Jesus. This is what he does differently than the first Adam. He says, not my will. Not that his will was ever contrary to the will of his father. They were always in sync. But he's saying, not my will, but your will be done. Not an easier way, not an alternative choice. Your will be done. I'll pour myself out for the sins of the world. So that's the key. Not my will, but your will be done. He's given himself over totally to the will of the father. And then what happens? He's betrayed. He's betrayed by Judas. He even said it back at the Last Supper. He said, one of you is going to betray me. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And it was Judas. And you'll notice this. It's just a little observation. Judas left Mass early. I, did, I didn't write it, but just take note of that. Since I started noticing that, I have never left Mass early. But Jesus goes, of course, to the garden. He's betrayed by, by Judas, and in, kind of in the same way as the first garden, acting as a friend. He goes and he kisses him, rabbi, and he's betrayed, and he is turned over to the authorities. Now, the movement, it, it can be a little bit confusing at this point, where is he before Herod? Is he before Pilate? Is he, who is he before? And there's this movement. He's taken to Caiaphas' house, the high priest, and he's held. And then he's brought to Pilate. He's brought to Pilate, but then Pilate understands that Herod is in town, and he sends him over to Herod. Herod wants to meet him. Herod ends up sending him back to Pilate. So there's this movement that, that goes you know, back and forth during this time. But he goes before the council. He goes before Caiaphas in chapter 23, and uh, listen to the, to the dialogue here. This is fascinating, what they're accusing Jesus of. Remember when we first started to talk about the messianic fulfillment, and we were talking about Caesar Augustus and Caesar worship and how he was the one who brought the good news and he was the, the Pax Romana, he brought in the peace of Rome. Remember that? Well, listen to what they say as Jesus is before Pilate. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man perverting our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. So here's the leadership in this sort of makeshift trial. And they're saying, Jesus is not allowing us to give tribute to Caesar. Isn't that amazing? And saying that he himself is, is, is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he said, he answered him, you have said so. And Pilate said to the chief priests and multitudes, I find no crime in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. Then Pilate sends him over to Herod. Herod, of course, sends him back to Pilate. It's like, what do we do with this guy? And then in verse 13 of chapter 23, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who per was perverting the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges, any of the charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Listen to what the people say at this point. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. So what's happening here? Well, there was a custom 
every year at the Passover that the Roman government would release someone because it's a Passover. What's the Passover about? Release from bondage. So every year this custom is to release someone. Now you would think that the average bystander would come to the conclusion that, all right, let's let, let Jesus free. You know, we beat him. We, we, we've, we've said all these things. We've got this other guy called Barabbas. He's a murderer and an insurrectionist. He's a man of tremendous violence. And the people started saying, release Barabbas. Because Pilate said, I don't find anything worthy of death you know, concerning Jesus. Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I found, I found in him no crime deserving death. And then in verse 24, so Pilate gave sentence that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. This is incredible what is taking place here. Now, now it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of pressure on Pilate. And there's a lot of pressure on him to do the right thing politically. The card that is ultimately played in one of the Gospels is, if you release Jesus, Pilate, you are no friend of Caesar. How do you become someone back in the Greco-Roman world, in the Roman Empire? How do you become someone? You become what is literally a title, a friend of Caesar. It's a title. I'm a friend of Caesar. And how do you become a friend of Caesar? You sponsor games. You build temples, you do something that honors Caesar. And then you are given the title, friend of Caesar. So this is what's at stake and the people know it. And so when they sense that Barabbas will be released and, uh, or that Jesus will be released rather than Barabbas, they play that ultimate card against Pilate. If you release Jesus, you're no friend of Caesar. And that kind of does it at that point because having the favor of men and leaders is extremely important. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that they chose the way of violence. And the people said, peace in heaven. And at the beginning of Luke's gospel, it mentions peace on earth. But that way of peace, the way of Christ, has been rejected. It's been rejected. And now they have two people standing before Pilate. And I find this so fascinating. And I never saw this in years past until I started looking at the original languages and saw what the name Barabbas means. Here you have one man, a murderer in an insurrectionist standing before Pilate, guilty to go to hell. And then on the other side, you have the altogether lovely, pure and just Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And it hit me when I realized what Barabbas means. Barabbas is translated, son of the father. Son of the father. There you have one son of the father, guilty, on the way to hell, a murderer, a man of violence. Then you have the altogether lovely son of God. And they said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. My friends, I I am Barabbas. I am Barabbas. I am the one who is guilty. And Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. Sometimes I think we think it's pixie dust. You know, it's just, you're forgiven. But it isn't. He, in reality, took my place. I am free and released from my sin now because he took my sin and paid the penalty when he was innocent, even in my, even when I was a sinner in death, he took my, he loved me and he took my sin and now he has released me and going forward a little bit, which we're going to look at in our next lesson. What does he require of me now? You now, Jeff, 
release others. Forgive and release others for I have released you. I have forgiven you. And so you can see how heinous it is for me to receive the release and the forgiveness of Almighty God for all of my sins and to receive heaven. And then to say to my fellow brother, I won't release you. I'll make you pay. How awful that is. So I am Barabbas. You are Barabbas. Two paths, two ways of dealing with the problem. Barabbas and Jesus. Well, then they took Jesus and Gospel of Matthew says they put a crown of thorns on his head. And Luke shows Jesus' crown of thorns hearkening back to Genesis chapter 3. The curse shows him taking on the curses. Jesus is taking on the curses of Adam and he's taking on himself the curses of Israel. In chapter 23 verses 26 through 43, he's crucified. And on the way to that crucifixion, he carries the cross. And Simon the Cyrene comes and helps him. He's ordered to, actually. He helps in carrying that cross. And I like to challenge myself, and I like to challenge you. What is our response? Are we going to pick up our cross and follow Christ? He said, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. We remember this on Good Friday as we venerate the cross of Jesus. And that's where we say, Lord, I will be with you. I will walk with you. I will help carry this. Some of us, you know, we say, I'm so grateful for you dying for my sins. I am so grateful, Lord, that you died and I am on my way to heaven. How do we show that gratefulness? If we were there, would you do what Simon did? Would you help him in carrying that cross? You have that opportunity today. I have that opportunity today by saying yes to Jesus and joining my suffering with the suffering of Christ. Now, I want to read a, a text to you uh, from Galatians real quickly here. And if you, you have your Bible, you can turn over there to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14 are going to talk to us about the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And what that means in relationship to Abraham and the three promises. Remember in Genesis Genesis chapter 12, land, I'll give you land, royal dynasty, and worldwide blessing. The land was fulfilled here in the conquest. They came into the land. The royal dynasty was established in 2 Samuel 7 with the covenant with David. Worldwide blessing now through Jesus Christ, as this new and everlasting covenant is opened up to the whole world. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Galatians. In chapter 3, in verse 13, he said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree, that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So the promise has come unto us now, the Gentiles, through the cross of Christ. Well, Jesus rose from the dead, didn't he? He was buried first. He was buried in a tomb. He was buried in a tomb in Luke 23. And look at, uh, real quickly here, look at Luke 23 and Verse 53, you're all familiar with Joseph of Arimathea, right? Joseph of Arimathea, he's the one who ended up asking for Jesus' body. They laid him in a tomb, laid Jesus in a tomb, and he's the one that was really given custody at at that point. Listen to what it says here. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their purpose and deed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down. Listen to the language here. He took it down off the cross, took the body off the cross, and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him 
in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation. So Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of Jesus, wraps the body in linen, and lays it in a rock tomb. Now, what's interesting about that is that the, the, the language that is used there is the language that is used at the beginning of Luke's gospel. When it talks about the Blessed Virgin Mary taking the baby Jesus and wrapping him in swaddling clothes and laying him in a manger. Now, we think of a manger as this wooden little crush scene, but a manger would be made out of stone where the animals would feed from. And so you have these bookends, if you will. You have the gospel starting off with the Blessed Virgin Mary gently wrapping the baby Jesus in linen and laying him in a manger. And at the end, Joseph of Arimathea taking the body of Jesus off the cross and wrapping him in linen and laying him in a rock tomb. What do they have in common? They speak of the how vulnerable Jesus is. That he came to earth as a baby in the arms of a loving mother. And he loved the world and gave everything. There he is now laid in the tomb. He's laid in the tomb. Do you know what happens? Three days later, the empty tomb rises from the dead, defeating death, death, hell, and the grave. And then after he rises from the dead, and I would really, I would really I encourage people to read Corinthians, because Paul makes this whole argument that if Christ wasn't crucified and died and rose from the dead, then your faith is in vain. And because Christ rose first, defeating the enemy, we'll rise as the second fruits. We will rise too. Well, real quickly, in Luke chapter 24, after this, after he is crucified and put into the tomb and they go to the tomb and they find it empty on in Luke 24 there's two people on the road to Emmaus this is fascinating they're on the way to Emmaus and uh, they are discouraged they're discouraged heads hung low walking away from Jerusalem and Jesus joins them Cleopas and someone else and some believe it's a husband and wife and Jesus joins them, and I love it. He says, <laughs> uh, you know, he's talking to them, and, and he engages them in conversation. And I, and I love what they say. They say, are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened these last few days? And Jesus says, what? And they start to explain about what, what happened to Jesus. And then it says in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself so remember we've been talking about this the whole time that it all points to jesus it finds its fulfillment in jesus and so here's jesus explaining to these people how all of this had to happen how he had to die and be buried and rose from the dead what a tape series huh what a phenomenal teaching to listen to jesus explaining all of this and later they said our hearts burned within us but here's what i want want you to see is that they were walking away from Jerusalem. They lost their story. It wasn't making sense. But it was when Jesus explained Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he explained them that he was the one that it was all speaking about. And he fulfilled all of this. That their eyes were opened in the breaking of the bread. He, he was invited, you know, to stay with them. And in the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, their eyes were open and the story was explained. And I love it because it ends with them going back toward Jerusalem. How many of us know people today that have left the Catholic Church because they can't make sense of things? It doesn't seem to make sense. And they are leaving and walking away. My friends, we need to tell them the story, the plan. And how it finds all of its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. When we do that and we tell people the plan and the story, we see people coming back to the church, coming back to faith in Jesus Christ. It all makes sense with Jesus. And then uh, something kind of interesting too, very interesting in fact, is that 
uh, in the Emmaus Road event in Luke 24, we see the, the structure of the mass. Jesus teaches, he gives him his word, which is the liturgy of the word, the first part of the mass. And then he, second of all, breaks bread. And that's the liturgy of the Eucharist. And it's in the breaking of the bread that their eyes are opened up. And that's what we go through in every mass. We listen to his word. And then there is the liturgy of the Eucharist. Well, after that, in chapter 24, in verses 36 through 49, Jesus appears to the disciples. And um, of course, he opens up their, their minds. So let's conclude. Let's conclude this. Why did Jesus come? Well, he came certainly to die for our sins. He came to, to deal with the original sin and the, the mess we got ourselves into with Adam and Eve. He came to pay the price for the broken covenant with Israel. He came to establish his kingdom and rule as king of the universe. He came to establish his authority in the papacy. He came to establish the seven sacraments where we can continue to have an encounter with him. He came to establish his church. The great exodus has begun, not from Egypt, but from sin and bondage. And we're going to see in our next session, we're going to see in the next session, after going through all of this, we're going to see that the story doesn't end here, but he's going to give the responsibility to that early church to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. In fact, Matthew's gospel is how, you know, how it's how he ends this. He says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So that's the great commission. That's what we are called to do. In our next lesson, we will see that early church take up the call filled with the Holy Spirit and they will go out and they will begin to do the works of Jesus. Just like Jesus fulfilled all righteousness by recapitulation, reliving, reliving Israel's story, the early church, as we're going to see, is going to go forward by reliving the life of Christ and being Christ to the world. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, as you said at the very end of Luke's gospel, you are witnesses of these things. Lord, we are. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us the strength to go out into the world and be witnesses of your resurrection, and to go out into the world and proclaim freedom and release to the captives. We thank you for your eternal sacrifice. You have set us free. You have given us life. Praise be to God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow, wasn't that something? Um, yes, the, the wow. Um, gosh, uh, there there are some details I, that I do want to uh, just point out. Although that this was a very powerful lesson, I don't know how anybody could improve on uh, on Jeff Caven's presentation. Um, um, but I'm going to try, yes, the unworthy as I am. Um, I want to go back to uh, chapter 21, um, where, um, uh, like uh, verse 20, when when Jesus is uh, is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and those who are inside the city depart. Now, and that's exactly what the Christians did uh, in, uh, so 40 years later, when the, the Roman war starts in, or it started in 66, AD and it culminates in 70 AD <clears throat> and um, 
there was a lot of resentment against um, those early Christians because they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They they fled to the hills. They fled to, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the name of the town, uh, Perea, I believe it, it was, and which is, uh, you know, well beyond and, and up in the hills. They fled. They were not a part of the siege. Of, of Jerusalem. And um, as you can imagine, uh, that caused some very, very hard feelings. So, uh, you know, when it's all resolved and things are going back to a, a new level of uh, a new normal, the, the Jews were not uh, very kindly. They did not act very kindly toward the, the Christians who were also Jews. Um, but uh, Jews who were now following uh, the Messiah, you know, the uh, Jesus. So, because remember, they used to meet at the temple. They used to meet in Solomon's portico, and, and they would have their gatherings there. Well, that quickly ended uh, in very short order after, um, after the siege of Jerusalem. Um, I also wanted to, you know, I feel so bad. You know, when, when you look at, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Simon the, of Cyrene, he's there with his two sons. We, we learn in the Gospel of Mark, <coughs> he's got two sons with him, Rufus and Alexander. They're named in Mark. They're not named in Luke. Uh, and interestingly enough, in the, in the <coughs> um, uh, Mark, they send greetings <coughs> to, uh, to Rufus and Alexander in, in uh, the letter to the Romans, they, they send greetings to Rufus and his mother. Uh, and, um, you know, many Bible scholars uh, make the connection between Rufus and Alexander and the Rufus that's in, and his mother who are in Rome. <clears throat> so the, the experience that Simon, the, you know, of Cyrene, must have had with the precious blood of Jesus. You know, I mean, he, Jesus is bloodied. He's been beaten. He's been, you know, uh, scourged. So, uh, you know, and they're worried that he's going to die before he gets to the place of execution. So that's why they have to press this guy into service helping Jesus was probably the last thing he wanted to do. You know, he's there with his two sons. He's probably saved his money all his life to, to be able to bring his, his kids to Jerusalem for the Passover. You know, this is like a once in a lifetime experience. And, and then he gets pressed into service. Uh, and he has to help this, this guy who's bleeding. And, and how do you become unclean? And, and so, and the purification process takes four days. Uh, you have, so you have to go through purification four days before you're clean enough to go worship in the temple. So this guy has, you know, I, I'm just trying to put myself into his place. Him and his two sons, you know, they're so excited about being in Jerusalem for the Passover. And there's like a million people there. And, and they're going to be part of all this. They're going to go into the temple. And now he can't. You know, he can't because he's unclean. But he's unclean because the precious blood of Jesus has just, you know, and, and what happens in that in that moment, you know, we find out later in, in uh, Romans and in Acts of the Apostles that, um, you know, he's converted and his family's converted. You know, I mean, that's just so touching. Absolutely so touching. Um I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, uh, talk about the one aspect of the Last Supper. We fail to recognize how radical Jesus's uh, language was uh, when he's talking to his, he's at the Last Supper and, and, and they finished you know, the supper and he's shared the, he's broken the bread, blessed it broke it, you know, and, and the same with the chalice. And then he says, do this in memory of me. 
And it's number one, do what? Do, do this in memory of me. The obvious question is do what? Well, the, the answer, according to uh, Professor Father Pepka, when I had him for, for scripture, the, the scriptural foundations of the liturgy, is um, to do this. This was a Passover meal. It was the uh, Jesus and his apostles' Passover meal. It was a Seder. So it was a sacrificial, sacred meal. It was a sacred meal to commemorate the Passover. You, so do this. Okay, do the Seder. Not just at Passover, but do the Seder all the time. And in memory of me. Not in memory of this event, as the Jews did. The Jews you know, commemorated. Actually, they didn't, in their, in their experience, anybody who went to a Passover Seder was at the original Passover. You know, in their, that was their mentality, their worldview. The way that they would remember was to, you know, to recreate the events, you know, and, you know, in Jewish tradition, they leave a chair vacant for Elijah, because Elijah is supposed to come before, um, you know, the, the, the Messiah comes. Um, so this this ritual meal that that Jesus shared, Jesus changes it completely. And and e I mean even the 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 word that we use to describe it, you know, toda, but it's Eucharist, Eucharistia. That's you know it's the Greek version of toda. Um, so this is a Toda offering a thanks. Like, by the way, if you ever want to say thank you to a Hebrew speaking person, just say Toda, because that's how you say thank you. Um, so uh, this Toda experience, the Toda offering is, is you know, what, what we have every hour of every day, because somewhere in the world, every hour of every day, there's a mass going on somewhere. Um, just, so, you know, some other thoughts I would share. You know, this uh, uh, Herod thought, you know, Herod, Herod considered himself the, the builder. You know, he was the great, Herod the Great was Herod the Great Builder. You know, he, he rebuilt, you know, the temple. He made it, you know, more magnificent than, than what it was prior. He, you know, he, he liked to build things. And yet, um, where's his temple? It's gone. Um, you know, where's all the other stuff? It's in ruins, you know, Masada, you know, his, his big hangout. It's, it's, you know, it's in ruins. Yeah, you can see the foundations and the outlines, you know, but is it functioning? No, no. Who in fact really is the great builder? You know, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. It, uh, what's still standing? Not necessarily in a you know in in stone and glass, but what's still standing in the in the hearts of people, the church, you know what Jesus built is still here and growing. Uh, I I just thought I'd you know point out the irony that you know uh, uh, Herod the Great wanted so much to be remembered as a builder. You know, and uh, and yeah, you remember him when you go to Masada and you walk through the ruins, you know. But we live the church every day, you know, in our own home. So, Anna, one of the things that I remember that um, Father Pepka and there's Rick. God Richard. bless his heart. Oh my God! It's nice to see you, Rick. Hi. 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 How's <laughs> How's Where Michigan? <laughs> We're in Michigan. We're in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And you look like you're walking. Yes, you I'm at a store. I was <laughs> just listening to you a little bit. I was at a, uh, I was at a uh, something called Pulaski Days Parade. It's a Polish parade. Yeah. And uh, there's a guy who's running for Congress named John Gibbs. And he's very, very Catholic, oh. very faithful Catholic. And, uh, Republican and so I was he was walking in the parade so I was walking with him with a bunch of other people like awesome. maybe 80 people or so walking with him so awesome. that's what I was just doing oh, and then, uh, that's cool 
Yeah. Well, it's nice so. to have you back. We had to we had to ask to mute you though because we could hear your parade. So yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. That's okay. We were we were in the parade. Who is that? Yeah, we were in the parade. I love it's it. Good That's to hear great. your voice. Yeah. It's say, nice to have say, you back. Say, and, yeah. Yes, and I listened to just a little bit of the. Uh, I mean, the last part, probably the last fifteen or twenty minutes of the uh, of the presentation by uh, yeah. you know. Jeff yeah. Cavins. Yeah. So anyway, I'll let you well, go. I just want to say oh, hi. Nice well, to come see back, you. Come back and join us again next time. Yeah. Okay. Whatever Sometime when you're not in a store. Yeah. yeah, when you're yeah. not in a parade. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> a parade. Oh, nice oh, nice you to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, God, 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 God bless you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, Anna, I have a question for you, my dear. Yes. Um, in in If my memory is, is I know, very shaded i'm sure or guarded or whatever old it's just old. old anyway father pepka in his presentation on the mass one of the things that i seem to remember is the fact that he said and and he's very clear and i do have it on audio i may i may have to go back and listen but in addition to what you were saying he said that we are to participate in the priest, particularly when he is saying the words of consecration in remembrance, remembering Jesus, remembering that he was exiled. And so they are to participate in that exile. In other words, being taken from the world mm -hmm. into this new, you know. And the exodus are taken from exodus. The world. Right. Yes. Right. right. From bondage. Yes. Being free yeah. from bondage. And yeah. it really angers Father that that the priests don't understand that. He says they don't get it. And and, and, you know, and he's right. Yes. And he's absolutely right. They're, right. Uh, it's it's um, well, you know, their training is different. And, and he also said that, the, and I love this, and I do have this on the uh, on the website because I was so moved when he said that. He said. When they say precious chalice, he says precious is not a good translation. Precious reminds us of something of, sweet, of well, of of, of Mordor, mm. of Golem, my precious. Oh, my precious. Oh, oh, he said a better word would be inebriating chalice. Oh, so yeah. how it should change Enlighten us? us. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Change, change us. Yeah, yeah. Make an alteration. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I just I I remember that. You know, Anna, this stuff is so good. I have gone through the Bible several times with you know with Scott Hahn on on yeah. these old tapes back in the early nineties. I mean, right, right. You know, and I have yeah, I have all this stuff in there, but there never ceases to be an end. Oh, There's I know. More. I know. It's, a, it's more. astonishing. Always yeah. more. And it's like the symbolism of all. In all. Oh yeah. I, I do want to. I wanted to go back to the, um, you know, the the preparation for the Passover. Well, yeah. Where? Um, wait a minute. Where is it? No, go back to the um, the uh, Jesus entry into Jerusalem. So he tells his people, go into the village, and and you're going to find a colt tied. Yes. And it's a colt that no one's ever sat on before. Why is it important? Because. Yeah. A king like Solomon, and and this is symbolism back to Solomon's uh, um, uh, coronation. Uh, when when David was dying, <clears throat> one of David's older sons, uh, in fact, I believe he was the oldest uh, living son, <clears throat> claimed the crown for himself, and he was throwing a party for himself to celebrate his father's dying he's laying in bed dying and and the son is throwing a party a loud party for himself to celebrate the fact that he's going to be the new king or he is the new king uh, Bathsheba hears all the commotion finds out what's going on grabs the chief priest goes to see David and says remember you said your heir was Solomon and so David tells Zadok the priest Dress him in my royal garb. Put him on my uh, colt 
and have him parade in. Well, the chief priest does that very ceremoniously, dresses Solomon, sits him on top of David's colt, brings him in, and, and that ends the party. Okay, there's, there, there's the, that son is, you know, not crowned. Solomon is the, the crown prince and, and then the, the king, you know. And so this is like, um, it's, the, it's the coronation symbolism. And then a cult that no one's ever sat on. A king always had the prerogative. It was like the king's prerogative that if he needed something, um, and, and you'll see it like, especially during war, uh, even in our own country or, you know, other countries, that if somebody's got something that that is needed, you just, you know, you take it and you use it and, you know, you reimburse them later. But, you know, if you need it now, you get it. And a king could do that. So who has the authority to go take somebody else's property and then say, you know, well, the Lord has need of it. The master has need of it. The king. Jesus is the king. He takes, you know, he, he can command the use of that animal. He, so he would be the first to sit on it. And then after that, you know, anybody can sit on it. But he has to, uh, the king has to be the first. There, I mean, that's, it's just a little detail, but it's important. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Um, uh, really good. Um, and you know, it's amazing how many references are not in the Bibles, the back and forth references, right? You know, the scriptural references, the connections. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The connections are not there. Um, and then there's even uh, Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah uh, pr um, uh, predicts the coming of the Messiah. And, you know, here he comes riding on a colt, you know, the foal of an ass. You know, and it's, you know, the same. This is not a mistake. And I also wanted to point out, these are also uh, the people who are with Jesus when he's coming into Jerusalem and saying Hosanna to the son of David, you know, and throwing their clothes so that, you know, he walks on there, those are the people who were with Jesus when he came down from Galilee, you know, because everybody was coming for the Passover. So it's, you know, it's a big pilgrimage, you know, feast. So there's this whole group of people that are coming from all the villages north and, and along the way until they get to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it's not the people, it's not the same people who a week later are saying, crucify him, crucify him. You know, because you can get that impression, uh, especially in John's, you know, in John's gospel, when he just talks about the Jews, the Jews. When John so talks about the Jews, he's talking about those in Jerusalem, you know, those, those Jews who live in Jerusalem, you know, not the ones that were coming uh, down from the Galilee with Jesus. That's an important point. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh man, if there was ever, if I could pick one time, one event to time travel to, you know, it would be the road to Emmaus. Can you, I mean, that is like the first Bible study, you know, serious Bible study uh, in, in documented, you know, Christian history that can you imagine mm -hmm. having all of scripture opened up and explained to you? Mm -hmm. You know, oh, one thing I wanted to point out that when it talks about that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus um, and, and talking with each other about all things that had happened. The, that's a very sanitized uh, translation because what the word that they use means is they were throwing words at each other. So this was not like, Oh, let's just take a let's take a nice little stroll along the river and and we'll just talk about life. No, this was a they were not 
taking a leisurely stroll. Uh, these were excited people having an animated conversation and probably getting out of Dodge. Uh, he's, uh, Jeff mentioned that some people believed that the other person was, that it was a husband and wife. I am of that belief because it only because it says that one of them is Cleopas. Who was one of the Marys who was at the foot of the cross with uh, the mother of, of Jesus? It was Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Mm -hmm. So Mary, the wife of Cleopas, is, is hanging out at the crucifixion with, you know, the, 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 the mother of the man who just got crucified. You know, there's probably a target on her back now. You know, it, it, you can imagine the, the husband's thinking, mm -hmm. and we got to get out of Dodge, and we got to get out of here fast. And, and, oh, my God, this, you know, and then talking back and forth, and here's Jesus coming along, you know. You can just see it, you know, and, and he, he hides his identity from them. Uh, their, you know, their eyes were veiled, and and you know what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and I, I just love it because they're walking excitedly, talking excitedly, and then notice they stop walking. He stops walking. I don't know if you caught that little detail. Um, let me find it. Mm -mm -mm. But their eyes were him. What is this conversation? Then one. Uh, uh, Oh, God. Oh, then one of them, uh, let's see. Oh, then one of them, Cleopas, answered him, are you the only? And he said to them, what things? Where did I notice that he, they, he stopped walking? And he goes, really? Are you the only one? I'm trying to find it. Oh, here it is. What is this conversation which you are holding with each other? Verse 17, which you are holding with each other as you walk. And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you, and can't you just hear the exasperation in his voice? Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? what things <laughs> and you know so he goes on and then oh you what is it where does he say oh you foolish men slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary that the christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory i mean he's referring to the suffering servant isaiah's suffering servant wasn't it necessary didn't it was like didn't i already tell you in my in my sacred word that the messiah would have to suffer you know don't you remember the suffering servant stories hello uh -huh. i mean you can just hear it god i would have loved to have been there uh and beginning with moses and all the prophets he interpreted for them all the scriptures all the scriptures all the scriptures and uh jeff mentioned that this is the format of the mass that first jesus teaches then he breaks bread that if was you, good. If you think back to the Sermon on the Mount or the uh, or the feeding of the 5,000, mm -hmm. that's the same formula, you know, preaching, sit down, eat, you mm -hmm. know, that, that it's the same format. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the, the, the liturgy of the word, the liturgy, you no, know, the liturgy of the Eucharist, the, the table of the Eucharist same that is jesus's uh what do they call what are they what's the uh, doris you're an educator what's the word that they use pedagogy the pedagogy of jesus the, the wow. his way of teaching his method of teaching preach sit down eat <laughs> so Donna, one of the yeah. things that father michael schmidt uh says is is on them as far as the married couple which i think is perfect is that it started in the garden with the married couple and then it was explained and completed with a married couple the married couple yeah oh, i just love oh. that and and thank you you know how it looks like jesus wants to continue but it's already dark so these guys have reached their destination where they're going to spend the night and, and Jesus looks like he's going to go on. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, uh, uh, their invitation to him was more than just, oh, come join us for dinner. Oh, no. It was like, get inside. 
because there was a curfew. If you were not a Roman citizen, and if you were out on a Roman road after dark, the presumption was that you were up to no good. And, and so, you know, Roman soldiers come across you on the way. If you're not part of a caravan or uh -huh. like you're just a single guy, uh -huh. you know, they, they think you're a robber. You're, uh -huh. you're up to, you're clearly, you are up to no good. So, <laughs> King they, of Kings. <laughs> so to save him, uh -huh. they did not want him to be out by himself after dark on the Roman road. So it's come, you know, come stay with us, you know, and, and so they're, they're, in their, their destination, they're safe, they're having dinner, and then their eyes are opened. And it's like, you know, and then Jesus, of course, disappears. And and what what do they do? It's like, forget the curfew, forget, you know, it, it, we got to get back to Jerusalem and tell Peter what happened. You know, it's like fear of death, goes away you know mm. we have a mission we got to get back we got to tell the others got to tell peter and the others what happened that's that, a big symbol that that is huge yeah that's that huge huge to leave the safety where they were expose themselves to danger to go tell the good news and then yeah mean, and it's our it's our calling too to face whatever is in in our path to to share the good news and right. they go back toward jerusalem which is where everything bad just happened they yeah. go toward the yeah, danger they, they go back to the you know they were the, leaving the, it the scene of now, the crime yeah they now go they're back going to back to, the toward it yeah and that's that's our journey yeah you know to go toward the cross toward right yeah toward the there's problem. a great line there's a great line in michael o'brien's father elijah uh sarah i don't know if you've gotten to that place yet we haven't in class yet but it he says the over or he says the zealous cannot um sit still basically they they've mm -hmm. got to get out there and you know do what they've mm -hmm. got to do they're, they gotta yeah. share yeah. Yeah. yeah they've got to and i don't you feel that way yeah. i mean I, you do you feel that way you've got you know, just talking to anybody who oh, listen, which there aren't many. But right. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Huh. Yeah, it's really striking, you know, how the, the Passover was a release from bondage. It was a, 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 a reliving of their release from bondage. And, and, the, and he changes it to our release of, bond, of bondage. Right. You know, right. Yeah. I didn't know I was Barabbas until today. We're you know, all I know. I just it. never saw it that in that light, That's you know, till mm -hmm. till he went through that. Even Barabbas knew he was Barabbas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> even he knew. Yeah. I just caught on today. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. so. It's beautiful. This is so amazing. Well, um, we start next time on the age of the church. So we are leaving the gospel of Luke and going to uh, part two of Luke's uh, uh, story, which is Acts of the Apostles. So the next time that, that we meet, we will, it'll be um, part one of the age of the church. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? No, just have a lot of, lot of thoughts. That yeah. just the garden and the garden, and I mean, so many yeah. correlations. You know, uh, Doris, how many times have been have you been through this? This is the second time. Is this the second time? Okay, because honestly, I on Auburn Boulevard when you were right. Yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. In fact, and we're doing this again because Doris asked. I know. Doris, <laughs> Thank, oh, you. Thank Doris. you, Doris. Thank, Thank you, Doris. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, let's remind ourselves that we are in the holy presence of God. 
and uh, where where two or more are gathered, and and this is a gathering here on Zoom. Yes, um, you know Jesus is here with us, so we we actually um, look to His Blessed Mother, who is the best advocate anybody could have, uh, to take our our um, concerns to her son and be our advocate. Um, obviously, we want to uh, uh, pray that that you know uh, God will break the hearts of you know break our hearts of stone and give us you know loving hearts and that we can see through the lying words uh, you know of all these propositions that that uh, are being fed to us um, and you know that that people will you know start thinking you know using their god-given talents to to be analytical and not just take you know on the surface you know mm-hmm. believe what's on the surface but to but to examine things and examine them in the light of christ in the, in, in the light of our faith so that's you know that's one of my concerns another concern obviously is we we need to pray for our priests um and you know and for our bishops this is a difficult, difficult time in our church and a difficult time in the world. Uh, and, and they need all the inspiration the Holy Spirit can give them. Um, and so we especially pray to Our Lady under the, her title, you know, Queen of the Clergy. Um, and also uh, that we pray for peace. Uh, this whole Ukraine situation, you know, it's like every day there's a new development and um, we need to pray. We need to pray for peace in our houses, peace in our hearts, peace in our houses, peace in our community, you know, and peace on earth. So you know, we also ask Our Lady, Queen of Peace, to to listen to our prayers. So let's do the three Hail Marys. I, I really like that devotion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, 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 Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us, us sinners, now, now and at the hour God. of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Mm-hmm. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God. God Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady Queen of Peace. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady Queen of the Clergy. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Our Lady of Peace. Queen of Pray, for, pray, us. pray, pray for, us. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Okay. See you. Thank you. Per- hey, hey, Doris. Doris, tell Percy yep. hello. Tell yes. Percy yes. hello for Please us. Please do. How's he doing? Yeah. Is he doing okay? Yeah, he's doing fine. Mm-hmm. Cool. Good. Okay. That's Thank wonderful. You. God bless you all. We'll see you Thursday. You and yes. then and then on the 22nd. So and then Monday. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Monday. Yes, Monday, Monday, Monday. At the store, Sarah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, cool. That's our store. Yeah. <laughs> That's our store. But Sarah's on board now, man. She's not missing a cool. one. I, I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> That's great. I, I love it. All right. God bless you all. God bless you. Shalom Thank Shabbat. You. Shalom Shabbat. Shabbat. Okay. Shabbat. 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 Shabbat.